Thanks a lot. We are going to pick up from where they left off for our opening panel. So Africa has about 300 companies that have turnovers over a billion dollars. Do you know how many there are in Europe? Take a guess. Numbers. Silence. 2,700. There are about 3,300 in Asia. Thanks a lot, gentlemen. We appreciate it. So how can the public and private sectors build these high-performing African multinationals through government strategies, partnerships, or regional value chains? That is the subject of our next conversation. And it's now my pleasure to invite our panelists. I'm going to show them where they're going to sit. Our first panelist is a qualified lawyer who had an accomplished career in the private sector before her current role. Please welcome the First Lady of the Republic of Namibia, Her Excellency Monica Gengos. Thanks a lot. Our next panelist is a group CEO of EcoBank and my countrymate, Jeremy Awori. First Lady, welcome right here. Our next panelist also joining us back on the stage, IFC's Regional Vice President for Africa, Sergio Pimenta. And our final panelist is from Cameroon. Please welcome the President and CEO of Spectrum Group, Colin Mukete. Over there. Yes, the middle. Yeah. Thanks a lot. But before we get to this panel, we're going to have an expert presentation from Acha Leke, senior partner and chairman of McKinsey and Company Africa. Acha, the stage is all yours. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, bonjour. Good morning. We're very quiet today. Um, very excited to be here, and thanks again to uh, Amir and the entire team for uh, another great, uh, looking forward to the next two days at the CEO Forum. Um, Maya Angelou once said that if you don't know where you come from, you don't know where you're going. So as we look to build the next 3,000 um, uh, African champions, we first need to understand where we're coming from. How many are there today? And, uh, and, and how are they doing? And at McKinsey and Company, as you know, we um, uh, publish a report um, uh, every few years. And we have a new, our latest report coming out today, actually, on Africa's future. Um, the reports, we used to call them lions on the move. By the way, we're not calling lions on the move anymore because we're tired of people asking us, where are the lions? When are they going to arrive? Why are they slow? Um, but as part of that report, we spent a lot of time trying to understand uh, the landscape of African business champions. We spent many, many months trying to get the data for this. And the good news, as we've seen, uh, as you'll see, the 345, to be exact, $345 billion companies in Africa today. 20 of them have revenues of over $10 billion, and another uh, 325 have revenues of over a $1 billion, between one and 10 billion. So the 345 such companies in Africa today with a cumulative revenue of about $1.1 trillion. Um, now the question is, you know, where are these companies uh, uh, based and uh, what is it going to do to, 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 um, to expand that, that list? If you look at where these companies are based, and I'll say, by the way, that most people actually think, when I ask the people the number, like Larry was doing, they usually give me a number between 10 and 50. And I always say your perspective on Africa is different if you think 50 companies make a billion dollars of more revenue or if you know it's 350, right? The, the, the continent is quite dynamic. About 45% of these uh, businesses are based out of South Africa. We have another about 30 in Egypt, 20 in Nigeria, 20 in Morocco, 23 in Nigeria. Um, but the business com the billion dollar companies across many of our, many of our markets, uh, apart from South Africa, in most markets we don't have as many as we should. Given the size of the economy, we should have more billion dollar companies and we're going to spend the next two days talking about what that was going to take. From a sector perspective, it's good to know that we have billion dollar companies across every single sector. Right? Every single sector on the continent today has billion dollar businesses. 
Uh, but the four sectors, oil and gas, mining, uh, fast moving consumer goods, and financial services, that, that have 60% of those businesses, right? But we have billion dollar businesses across every single sector on the continent. Now, what kind of businesses are there? The good news is two thirds of these businesses are African businesses, businesses that were started in one country in Africa and expanded across the continent. Within that, about half of them are private sector companies, whether they're listed or not, the private sector companies, many of you of which are represented here today, and another 15% are state-owned enterprises. But we also have a third of these companies that are foreign-owned, foreign multinationals that are present in Africa, where the Africa part of their business is over a billion dollars. And that's higher than in other regions. So foreign multinationals have an, an even more important role to play here in Africa than in other regions, to not just uh, make money for the shareholders, but to really make a difference uh, in, in the continent. Um, and Emil spoke about it at the beginning. Uh, the reality is we're excited about 345, but we're not as dynamic as other regions. The number has actually gone down from our analysis. We've actually reduced it by about 6% over the past six years in a context where China has increased its billion dollar businesses by over 57%. China has increased, uh, India has increased by 30%, and LATAM has increased by another 30%. Right? So we really need to figure out how we scale, first grow, f grow the number of business, billion dollar businesses, but also help the ones that we have today get even bigger. So we spent a lot of time analyzing what's the opportunity to grow these businesses. And you'll see uh, the numbers here. We think right now, as I said, there are about $1 trillion of revenue. We can increase revenue by, you can increase rev revenue by another 50%, so another $550 billion between now and 2030. So we've sized this at a sector level. And across every single sector, you can see this huge upside for these businesses across the continent, uh, and in a way where we can actually grow it by over 50% um, over, the next, over the next few years. What is it gonna take? And I know that's what we're gonna spend a lot of our time over the next few days talking about. Especially in this macro environment, some work we did globally as McKinsey showed that the decisions you make now are imp very, very important. Con companies that actually do better during the crisis create a much bigger strategic distance between them and the competitors over the next 10, 20 years. And we call those companies resilience, and you can see the top line, how it's growing, the, 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 the difference between the top and the bottom line is growing. So the, if you do well during the crisis, you're in a much, much better position than your competitors coming out of the crisis. What would it take? One is understanding where you need to have a through cycle mindset. Where do you really need to drive and, and invest? When people are retreating from investing, where should you invest? Is it in capital expenditures? Is it in recruiting? As people are letting go of staff, do you actually double down and get more people? We're really understanding where you should invest when people are retreating. The second is focusing on productivity. How do you really lower your cost base very quickly um, and, you pre and preemptively, even if you don't have to do it uh, uh, necessarily? How do you lower your cost base and reduce your break-even point? The third is these companies are much more active in M&A. They're really very active in figuring out which sectors uh, don't have, don't have uh, uh, tailwinds, they have some headwinds against them, so we should exit from those businesses, which businesses we should invest in, and we see them a lot more active in reallocating capital that way. Um, and then finally, much bolder in making decisions. So they don't just sit and debate and discuss, but eventually they make a decision and they move on. So that's what we will uh, encourage all of you all to do to build the next generation of billion dollar businesses. And as we go into our sessions, maybe just a few questions that you know, um, I'd suggest we ask ourselves over the next two days uh, to do this. One is, am I really positioning myself as an African champion? I, I, we ha I have to create value for my shareholders, that's important, but am I really making a difference to the continent and to, it, and to its people? Because we found that companies that have this approach of doing good and doing well, are the ones who are most successful in building profitable and sustainable businesses in Africa. The second question is about competitiveness. How aggressively am I at improving my competitiveness? Whether it's lowering my cost base, whether it's leveraging digital, whether it's increasing my efficiency, but how, how, how effective am I at doing that across my entire business? The third is reallocating capital. As I said, it's very important to figure out which businesses you want to get out, exit from, where do you want to allocate capital, and, and be quite dynamic in really reallocating capital into where the biggest opportunities are, uh, whether it's at a new countries, whether it's new cities, whether it's new segments, but how do you uh, pivot from where you are today? The fourth is building relationships. Again, we're here with the public sector leaders, the private sector leaders. It's very important to build relationships with a broader set of stakeholders whether it's governments, regulators, your board, your investors, how good are you at that? 
And then finally, we can talk about this, and I'll talk about talent. How good am I at retaining and attracting uh, talent that I need for my business, especially these days, retaining the talent, because we know that's becoming more and more, more and more difficult. Those are the questions I'll suggest we, we, we discuss over the next few days, and that hopefully with that together, we will build the next generation of African business champions. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Acha. Thank you so much. And that is a perfect place to begin this panel on. Thank you so much, Colin, Sergio, Jeremy, and First Lady. I want to start with you, Your Excellency, because before you were in this public role, you were managing director of Namibia's largest private equity fund, and you also sat on the boards of large public and private companies. Um, he talks about reallocating capital and providing value to shareholders. So what are your thoughts on building these champions across Africa that we're talking about? So when I was listening to his presentation, I was quite struck. It was eye-opening for me about how many of those African champions are in South Africa relative to Nigeria. Right. And then I was also struck by how few of these African champions were operating in power and utilities. Because we know that when you don't get power and utilities right, you really bring social, political, and economic challenges right. to your economy. Now, that was the one observation. The second observation I had, I, I think it happened on this panel, when the president of IFC spoke about President Ouattara being his former boss, the two prime ministers of um, Cote d'Ivoire and Morocco were both from the private sector. I'm from the private sector. Right. When you were calling me up, the prime minister of Cameroon almost got up when he heard lawyer. So you can see there's this, um, this movement of private sector talent into the public sector. And, and that's really the challenge that we have as a continent. We, our, our most complex problems, politically, socially, economically, are solved by governments, are our best brains in government. And to an extent, the answer is yes, but not in every place. So to me, we can't, if you want to be an African champion, we also need good coaches, we need good trainers, and, and that's the integration of this skill gap that you find in the public sector. And some of us who are sitting here, we can't all be African champions. Right. Some of us need to be coaches and trainers in the public sector. So I think the challenge I have for people sitting here is talent needs to start flowing upwards to government in order for us to develop these African champions that we're talking about. People are scared of going to government because it's too complicated. It's too messy. You feel that you just you can't move, you can't make any real meaningful change in government, the way African governments are set up. So you understand why people will be reluctant, right? I don't think they have a choice. It's like all of us sitting on this humongous Boeing, trying to go to a destination, but there's no pilot. There's no aircraft maintenance engineers. That right. plane is going nowhere. It is messy. It is complicated. But for as long as, so your system is only as good as the people who run it. So your state is only as effective as the quality of the people who are in it. So if all of us who have skill leave that system, what is it that we expect? Then we, 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 we can't talk about African champions. And I think talking about an effective state, maybe there is also an obligation on governments to resolve some political problems that create the messiness that we sometimes find. <coughs> Um, in the public sector. All right, you heard the first lady, give up your bonuses and go and work in government. <laughs> Colin, you're a real serial entrepreneur who's built an African champion. Your work spans mining and telecoms and media. You're also the chairman of MTN Cameroon. You own a third of the capital there. When we were talking about this panel before, you mentioned something that stuck with me, and I want to quote it. You said, the strategic partnership between most African states and African companies has failed overall up to now. What do you mean by that in the context of our conversation? Well, I think that um, when you, we who are entrepreneurs, we want to develop projects, we travel, and so most times when you uh, come up with, you work with your consultant over a period of time, maybe three, four years or so, and you come up with a project, and you take this project now to um, the governmental ministry that deals with it, you would most likely have to work with the technical advisor of that ministry. But the technical advisor is more of a civil servant as opposed to having been exposed to the project that you're trying to carry on. And so you find that most times you don't have the engagement that you need to have with the suggestion to pursue this project 
they, they need to be able to be able to engage. And that's really what I was trying to say, that in most African countries, you need to have the private sector engaged with the state. And this is very important because if you take uh, an economy like the United States, Colin, you could you move the mic closer to you, please? Okay. Yes. If you take, if you take an economy, economy like the United States, they have something called Council of Economic Advisors. And in there, you have all the big corporations, the heads of, of those big corporations meeting from time to time to advise the head of state in terms of policies that might encourage the development of the economy. So essentially what I was trying to suggest that there's a need to resolve this situation. There's a need for the private sector and the state to have collaboration. This is very important because that is the only way you can have the possibility to create an enabling environment since this would allow the private sector uh, entrepreneurs or, or businesses to be able to talk to the state to open up certain sectors or the difficulties that they are having. So people who have built things, not just theoretical civil servants who have this power over really important projects. That's what you're saying. That is correct, yes. Okay, just making sure. Uh, Sergio, as uh, IFC's Regional Vice President for Africa, you have a lot of relationships with uh, governments all across the continent, and I wonder if you get a sense that there's a will to try and create this environment that supports more African champions. Are there any success factors you're thinking about, or what is the recipe to build more of these billion dollar and plus turnover companies? Thank you, Larry. I think it's really a, a core question because we are at uh, the space between private and public and how, right. do we, how do we make them work together. And I think we have to have a very pragmatic and realistic vision of what, what can be done on that space. I mean, as you know, IFC is the private sector arm of the World Bank Group, so we do focus on private sector. And we've seen, of course, over the last few, last few years, last decades, that there's e every day a bigger recognition that, of the role that the private sector plays in the development of the economy. But it's not going to happen in a vacuum, right? It's, it's going to happen, as, as the First Lady was saying, in the context of the, the public policies that are enabling private sector to come in. And I think that's one of the parts that's very important, and it's one of the things we're doing at the World Bank Group, working with our colleagues at the World Bank, is to try and bring the two parts of the equation together. Bring in the private sector on the one hand and the public sector. So the work we do in that space is very important, and when it comes to creating more of these champions, I think we all have to, uh, we'll have to jump in, we'll have to, to participate. I, I thought that the presentation by HR was very interesting because it, it does give you the key dimensions of what companies need to focus in order to get there. You know, you have, you have to have the vision, you have to have the leaders, you have to have the, the people who have a strategy to say, okay, I'm going to develop this business. You also have to have the uh, vision to leverage the opportunities that this continent offers. I think we heard quite extensively this morning the incredible opportunities that we have, and particular when we look at regional integration, different opportunities, opening different markets and so on. You have, on another hand, to also look at the aspects of synergies and activities of these groups, these champions. These champions don't develop uh, just by one product in one country. It's, it's a much broader vision and a much more synergy of their own businesses, right? And then I would finally also mention, which is very, bringing back to your initial question, uh, these champions will not develop in a vacuum. They need to right. develop in a context where the business environment is conducive, is helping. Right? And, and that's one of the areas where you know, uh, many countries and the country where we are, Cote d'Ivoire, you can see all the reforms that have been done by the government to exactly do that, promote the development of private sector. So what do you see as the biggest challenge? If you just mention one thing that kind of cuts across many of these corporates, many of these um, organizations across the continent. I'm putting you in the spot here. What is the one thing that holds back so many from growing into the champions we want? I think, unfortunately, it's not just one challenge. And the, probably the complexity of the different challenges together right. makes it what is difficult. You know, it's very nice to say, oh, I want a perfect business environment, and I want a perfect market, and I want a perfect company. The world is not perfect. But I think the challenge, uh, I see more than a challenge, I see really an opportunity, right? Yeah. Is that when you look at today where Africa is, and when you look at how Africa is navigating the situation that the world is going through with this, all these different tensions, uncertainties, and so on, I see a huge opportunity for the continent to come together and really unlock its private sector. 
I mean, the numbers speak for themselves. There's right. so much that can be done. Um, and that's a good point for Jeremy to come in. Uh, you spent 25 years in the banking industry. You lead one of these champions now. And you live in Togo, which is a tiny country. So for any company out of there to grow, they've got to go beyond the borders. So your thoughts? I would say if we start with the end in mind, like if, if, if governments, leaders are saying, what needs to be true for us to have many more unicorns, many more companies that can compete at a global level and work back from that, then we can start thinking about what's the environment that needs to be in place for us to support those companies to grow. What are the skill sets we need for those companies to grow? So I think when you look at this, the statistics that we saw earlier, you look at China moving ahead, you look at India moving ahead. Right. Today, Africa's population is almost the same, if not larger than China and India, right? But there's a reason we're not moving ahead. Guess what? We have 54, 55 borders, which makes things a lot more complicated, right? So if we cannot figure out how to leverage scale to become competitive, a country like Togo will never be able to compete on the global market, right? Its GDP is strictly not big enough. We operate in 35 countries with GDPs ranging from 2 billion to 400 billion. Wow. Right? It, just think of that. A country with 2 to 3 billion, and we're trying to form strategies against a Nigeria which is 350 to 400 billion. The realities are completely different. When you think about regional blocks, what needs to be true? And I think if we start thinking about the environment, the rules, the policies, are they aligned? I have to deal with more than 38 regulators to run my business across the country. They all have their own rules. They all want different things. They all want different things, right? So the, what, what always befuddles me is, and it's a complicated balance for governments and for regulators, what's the right balance between being nationalistic and also being pan-African, right? So even if we talk about moving labor across the continent, it is a very difficult issue, getting work permits. We need the best and brightest skills to be in the areas of opportunity. Right. So, it, so I think it moves even beyond just the technical, right? What are our policies to do with technology? What are our policies to do with cloud computing? What are our policies and thoughts to do with AI, right? What are our thoughts to do with intellectual property rights, enforcement? Because technology is going to be the differentiator in my mind. And if we don't embrace technology to become competitive, in a way, we've almost cleaned the past. The past we can scrub with a board, and we can say we've got the best and brightest young people if we can empower them with the right environment. And as you say, if we get some courageous people to move from the private sector into government to create that environment where you can have meaningful conversations about these subjects, I think we can be able to get the, those numbers, you know, double or triple or ten times, as we've said. This is fascinating to me. I think you're the bank, the Pan-African bank, with the largest footprint on the continent. And the way you get um, rewarded by that is almost by being punished, by having to deal with 38 different regulators who cannot harmonize what their requirements are. If you're already licensed by the Reserve Bank of South Africa or in Nigeria or in Kenya, then in Ghana they want something else, in Tanzania something else. That's crazy. And, and you see, the, I, I feel for some of the smaller emerging markets, right? because how do they get scale? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a real challenge. And if you just go by straight economics, you would say, this has not got the opportunity. Let me cut off the tail. Let me focus on the It's not market. worth the trouble. It's, it's, it is, we have a responsibility, and that's the beauty of our purpose, really trying to make a difference across the continent. But as I say, if we want to work with, with policy makers, with governments, with regulators to try and see how do we harmonize these? How do we get systems and solutions that work for us? Because we have to find our own solutions. And I'll give you an example. In Africa, we have built technology that allows us to give thousands and thousands of loans a day for a few hours. Right. Tell me where that happens in the world. It, it does not happen. I was talking to very senior people in the US. They don't do that. That need is not there. That's something we developed working with the telcos, working with governments to be able to do it. If we can shine a light on these innovators, bring innovative solutions to our context, but scale is essential, otherwise we will never be competitive.
That's the point I want to bring up with the First Lady, because Namibia, like uh, a couple of other African countries, have a large surface area, but um, tiny markets, when you look at the buying power of the population, um, but this has tremendous implications for infrastructure and digitization. He was talking about expanding those markets. How can Namibian companies, um, in the meantime, serve their own people, but also trade with their neighbors and trade with the world? It's this efficient and effective state that we're talking about. Um, so being a small economy, we're very vulnerable to external shocks. Now, we must play to our strengths and not our weaknesses. And as you mentioned, we've got a strategic landmass. It's, um, it's got a long coastline. It's got good solar and wind energy and lots of land, which really puts us in the front row when people are speaking about green hydrogen. And, and, and with leadership and the inclusion of private sector um, skill, what the government has been able to do is last week sign a very large, the largest green hydrogen off-day contract um, in sub-Saharan Africa, which, which can potentially double the GDP of Namibia. And, and what that does is it really enables companies in Namibia to become these African champions. In the same context, uh, Namibia will become oil producing in the next 10 years and oil alone will double the GDP of Namibia. This is away from green hydrogen. But to me, that's not the success story because oil is almost luck. The development of green hydrogen in Namibia is leadership. So right. it is leadership, it's, it's skill. And that's what the private sector will leverage from. You must have leadership that incorporates skill from the private sector, that removes the messiness that you were talking about earlier, that uh, removes the inefficiency um, but, but beyond Namibia as well, I just look at how difficult it is for a Namibian to get to Abidjan. Right. Southern Africa and West Africa is not connected. We must fly east and then do a couple of hops in order to get here. Now, if people can't move, high-level people like you have in front of you today, which is highly inefficient, right. then goods can't move. So we must also fix... Um, how our airlines operate in order to facilitate the movement of people and goods in an efficient manner. You don't even get me started on the inefficiency about airline travel in Africa and the places you can't get to without going to Istanbul or Doha or Paris. It's a whole subject that we could be here until the cows come home if we start talking about that. I saw Sergio nodding as Jeremy was talking about um, the need to expand markets and break down these uh, different uh, problems we have, regulatory, ETC, um, obviously, we talk a lot about the African Continental Free Trade um, Agreement and how that area, being, building this one free trade area, the, size, the biggest since the World Trade Organization, I think would open up these tiny markets into one big hole. Okay, so it's, yeah, I was nodding because it's, it's, it's so crucial in this discussion, right? In the sense that, I mean, look at the success of EcoBank. I mean, it's a bank that has expanded throughout the continent that has really demonstrated that ability that you can have a pan-African business. Right. And when you're looking at the list and the sectors that were in the presentation earlier in, this, in, this, uh, in, in the presentation I made earlier, you can see these are companies that have expanded beyond their borders. Uh, when you look at the size of the different economies in Africa, you have some large ones, but a lot are much more fragmented. So this is an area where I think we all have to put our efforts. And, 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 and I would put there, two dimensions. There's the public dimension, and, and the, the Continental Free Trade Agreement is a political agreement. It starts by that. Right. And, and it's important that the, the, on the, polit the political level that there is integration in terms of removing some of the barriers and doing some of the work that needs to be done. But the second component is the role of the private sector. And, and I see, I mean, I see we've been supporting a lot of companies in the continent that are expanding regionally, and they all seeing the opportunities, and this has been accelerated with the pandemic. You know, prior to the pandemic, a lot of our clients in the region were just focusing a lot on markets outside of Africa. Right. Now, I mean, maybe sometimes by necessity, but I think more obviously because they do see the opportunities. They see that, you know what, actually it's a better business to go across the border and, and, and to go beyond just my, also my comfort zone because Africa, a lot of countries are within sub-regional groups, right? So that, that, that comfort zone in terms of business. But having companies from East Africa invest in West Africa and vice versa, from southern to the north, I mean, you, that kind of uh, complexity of the continent, it's, it's what makes its wealth. 
So there's a lot that, that, we, that we can do there. We've been developing a lot of new products at IFC to support that uh, in terms of uh, uh, helping on the trade lines, helping facilitate trade intra-Africa. We launched a very interesting initiative to support uh, that kind of, of business. We've also been expanding our, our presence on the ground. We have, as of today, we have now uh, IFC offices in 35 countries across the continent. And one of the biggest, uh, I would say, uh, one of the most frequent questions that we get from our, the companies in those markets is, okay, you have an office here, but you also have an office somewhere else. How can I do business in that country? Can you help me? And I mean, when I, when I, I see, uh, well, I don't see because of the light, but when I saw coming into the room all the, 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 the all these brilliant people are in this room, I mean, from so many parts of Africa, I think this is really where the future is. This is where the opportunities are. Okay, Mr. Mukete, you're on this panel just so we could ask you this question because you know what it's like to grow from millions of dollars in revenue to hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. So what is your recipe for building champions and how do you scale up to that billion dollar number and beyond? Um, well, I Closer, think, please. Yes. yes, I think that uh, today we have an interesting situation in Africa. We have the continental market. And um, so when we look at um, the potential in terms of scaling, so to speak, because that's what the forum is all about, 300 yes. to 3,000, so to speak, uh, there is a need uh, for African companies that are in the market to produce products which actually meet international standard that can compete. I want to tell you that uh, um, I have seen Kenyan coffee in Costco in the United States. Costco is a warehouse, so to speak, and it is in almost every big town in the United States. That company that is in Kenya producing coffee, which has been accepted in Costco, it means that it meets all the standards. There are no pesticides or any type of products that might make it not palatable. But the good thing is that the coffee that has been produced in Kenya, it's possible now to expand to other markets like Asia. Imagine that same company shipping coffee into China, so to speak, because it's already in the United States where Costco, you have close to about 50 warehouses in each state, 50 states in the United States. So the potential is there to scale. Now, how do you do this? I think that um, companies really need to want to produce products which are competitive in the world market, taking into consideration comparative advantage. So you can talk of producing items which are already being produced in Europe or in the United States and expect to compete in that market. Uh, of course, there is always the perception that all products from Africa are not uh, quite good, so to speak. That is where this concept comes in comes in, in terms of the comparative, comparative advantage. It's very important. Uh, and the other point I wanted to make is that uh, even the United States recognizes that today, Africa is the fifth largest economy in the world. Why? Because of 1 billion, 300 million people in the continent. And besides that, the total economy of the continent, so to speak, is $3.4 trillion. So it's a sizable market for any company that is producing products in its home uh, country to make it competitive, to be able to export within the AFTA or the Africa Continental Free Trade Area, and then look to go globally. This is a way to move from $100 million to multi-billion dollars. I, I hope I've answered your question. Fantastically, answered it well. I have just a minute and a half left. Jeremy, final thoughts real quick on um, your vision or how we build these African champions. I think there's the issue of partnerships that we haven't talked about. I think there's the issue of technology. How do we use technology? When we talk about, for us to build more unicorns, we have to go cross-border. There's no way that many, that's why you're seeing it's, it's largely Nigeria and South Africa. Those are the two right. dominant Big centers. economies, right? So if we're gonna go cross-border, we need the right partners. What we are trying to do as Ecobank is link people together 
right, to be able to trade, to do business. Um, we've got a My Trade Hub, which allows buyers and sellers to work. I think if we use technology, we need to think about payments. We need to think about non-tariff non barriers that are very real. We've talked about travel. We've talked right. about cross-border trade. Um, and I think we need to think about payments. How do you pay for goods that are, that are moving across? Okay. Excellency talked about that. But I think it's all to play for. And we should remain optimistic. All right. In the final 10 seconds, I'm going to give First Lady Gengos the chance to promote Namibia. Why you should go invest in Namibia? I don't think there's many economies that are going to triple their GDP in the right. next uh, 20, 30 years. And that certainly is Namibia. And we, we lovely, friendly people, really opening, open and welcome economy with great leadership. So that's why. All right. Thanks a lot. Please give them a big round of applause, Jeremy, Colin, Sergio, and the First Lady Monica Gengos. Thank you so much. This has been a fantastic panel, and we are right on time.